Hey guys, so I just wanted to make a video about uh, why I no longer read the classics. And I'm going to use a book by Calvino as inspiration, uh, which is titled, uh, it's a book of essays, Why Read the Classics. And, uh, yeah, of course I'm joking that I no longer read classics. But, uh, yeah, this semester I've had the opportunity uh, to be forced to read uh, YA books. And um, I've also recently tried to read graphic novels. And uh, <clears throat> that's due to some teaching classes I'm taking and the fact that some kids like reading graphic novels and... Well, I just wanted, wanted to read a nice section from this Calvino essay first. So it just kind of gives uh, definitions for what a classic is. Like, for example, uh, a classic is a work which relegates the noise of the present to a background hum, which at the same time the cla classics cannot exist without. And then he talks a little bit about Giacomo Leopardi, who's able to educate himself on all the, like, liter uh Latin Greek classics and he says uh, today a classical education like that enjoyed by the young Leopardi is unthinkable particularly at the library of his father Count Monaldo has disintegrated disintegrated both in the sense that the old titles have been decimated and then the new ones have proliferated in all modern literatures and cultures all that can be done is for each one of us to invent our own ideal library of our classics and I would say that one half of it should consist of books we have read and that have meant something for us and the other half of books which we intend to read, which we suppose might mean something to us. We should also leave a section of empty spaces for surprises and chance discoveries. And then he gives a little paragraph on why you should read works from your own country, in the sense that Italians need to read Italian classics and that they're indispensable. But also, you need to read foreign classics to be able to compare your Italian classics to. And then he says <clears throat> that he would rewrite his essay so that people do not believe that the classics must be read because they serve some purpose. The only reason that can be adduced in their favor is that reading the classics is always better than not reading them, which is very correct. If anyone objects that they are not worth all that effort, I will cite Joran, not a classic, at least not yet, but a contemporary thinker who is only now being translated into Italian. While the hemlock was being prepared, Socrates was learning a melody on the flute. What use will that be to you, he was asked. At least I will learn this melody before I die. So, uh, I've been thinking a lot about why you should teach the classics. Because also in this essay, Calvino says that you should teach certain classics as a kind of like directional tool for the for students so that uh, they can discover their own favorites outside of a schooling system, which I agree to an extent, but there are, of course, innumerable situations where a student has found a favorite book in school, you know, whether on accident or not. Uh, I have not had the fortune of that, apart from, like, enjoying... Edgar Allan Poe's poetry in in 11th grade, but uh, pretty much everything I've enjoyed I found outside of class, or I enjoyed it first, then I took a class on it. The only possible exception is uh, I got a much greater appreciation of Paradise Lost while taking a class on Milton, but... <clears throat> Yeah, I've been thinking about it because even the best YA books are very bad compared to even like moderate classic. And of course, people who read YA books don't realize that either because they can't write and so they have no ear for literature or no eye for literature, no mind for literature, or they're really young and they just don't know anything yet. Of course, the young people can be excused for for not knowing enough yet, because they just have to work a little more and 
learn a little more but I've noticed especially here on booktube there's there's a, like a shocking amount of people that read decent books and it seems like it's almost on accident that they read decent books because they also read absolutely dreadful books usually much faster and much higher quantity and they're just like fine with it it doesn't annoy them that they're somewhat throwing their time away like th that they don't even realize that uh, let's say like a quarter of the books that they read are significantly more valuable uh, than the majority of books they read in the sense that they'll remember them and they'll change their life and they'll be able to relate to other people <coughs> sorry I'm cold and I've never been able to understand that how someone can like read horrible stuff and it doesn't just totally mess with their head because when I was reading these YA books I had to read it for a class on adolescent literacy which is maybe my least valuable class I've ever taken at a college and uh, I actually just got an email from the teacher why I haven't submitted some assignments I'm thinking about telling her the truth <laughs> but uh uh, no, it's, um, yeah, why books are terrible, but they win prizes. But I did have the fortune of uh, teaching a seventh grade English class, and uh, the lesson was given to me, and it was about uh, metacognition, or basically reading comprehension, and we were using a poem. I didn't like the poem. Uh, it was called the... Uh, the Paperweight by Gertrude Schnackenberg. And uh, really, it's a, quite a simple poem. And the, the smart kids in the class got it, like, first read. But the system was that you read it to yourself, then the teacher reads it out loud, and then you annotate it, and then you discuss it. And by the time they discussed it, <clears throat> pretty much all of them had gotten it, either because, you know, the smarter kids explained it or... Uh, they overheard me helping other people. And, uh, you know, I thought of this lesson. I was like, well, what else do I do that's, that follows that form? And it's my Finnegan's Wake group I go to. Uh, we, you know, presumably read the page before you go, but you don't have to. And then when we get there, we read it out loud. Each person gets two lines, and we usually read it twice. And then we go through the whole page line by line for two hours and read it out loud and discuss it. And then we read it out loud straight through one person at the end. And I described this to the, to the kids, seventh graders, and I decided, you know what, I'll bring in Finnegan's Wake so they can see it. Why not? And so I got the projector on and I showed them the first page of Finnegan's Wake. And I pointed out some interesting things like how it starts with a lowercase letter. And I told them that's because, you know, the first sentence starts on the last page. And then almost immediately, uh, you know, one of the students was like, oh, so that means it's a circle. You know, like, it's a loop. <clears throat> I was like, yeah, exactly. And, uh, and then, of course, there's the famous thunder word on the first page that's a word with a hundred letters so I asked if anyone wanted to read it out loud and in each class there were two volunteers and so they read it and then in the second class uh, they wanted me to read it out loud too so I did but you know they were fascinated with this book and my teacher even used it because I taught um, two of the periods in the afternoon and she had one more after me after I left, and she even used that as her warm-up instead of doing what she had done. So that that was very uh, <clears throat> that was very nice to see. <coughs> Sorry if that's too loud, but it was very nice to see because I I wonder if anyone has ever done that before. <laughs> Showed um, Finnegan's Wake to a bunch of seventh graders, but you know <clears throat> it's really not that surprising because it's a funny book. But, and then the next lesson I taught, I started it with Emily Dickinson, and it wasn't quite the same reception as far as, uh, you know, more of them were bored with it. But, uh, yeah, so that makes me think, like, 
you know, a lot of my teaching classes, you know, really, it's, it's shocking and really depressing that they're pretty much telling me and my classmates who will end up being English teachers, presumably, to not teach the classics because they're too boring and they have too bad of a reputation. You should just teach them what they want to read, like YA books and, uh, you know, graphic novels and <clears throat> and all this type of stuff. And it's like, well, maybe, but if they want to read that, then they can just read that on their own, you know. If it's either at or below their level, which for any high school student, YA books are written below their level, if you're on like an average re reading level. And then, of course, if you're up above average reading level, you're going to be bored to death by YA books, at least I would hope. You know, why wouldn't you want to challenge yourself? <laughs> but, you know, a lot of my classmates are really on board with the, you know, note teaching classics because they don't even like reading them. You know, I can't tell you how many of my classmates who will be English teachers within the year tell me they hate poetry or they hate Shakespeare. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, they'll tell me they don't know really simple grammar terms, which is more forgivable because, uh, you know, teaching grammar really isn't that valuable in the end. I mean, teaching the words of grammar, like predicate or all this type of stuff, it's really not valuable. But, um, yeah, so many of my classmates, you know, they only read YA books for fun and they, they hate classics and... You know, Moby Dick is so hard. This sort of thing. And I'm like, well, no wonder our schools are such shit, you know. The people who are teaching don't understand anything. No wonder the students don't understand anything. is because they're being taught by incompetent people. And I'm actually in a pretty good program, you know, which makes it even more horrifying. Because I pretty much can't talk in class because I actually enjoy classics. Which is nuts. You know, it's nuts. If if, I, if someone had told me that this would happen before I got into this program, I would have been shocked. I would have not believed it. I would have said, no way. There's no way. You're being way too pessimistic. There's no way. There's, there's at least a couple people, you know, that read classics for fun and really get into it. No. I think what happens is all those people try to get a PhD because they think they're too good to be a, a high school teacher, a middle school teacher or something like that. And then they're not good enough to be a professor, either because they actually don't know anything or they give up or, you know, they write a dissertation on the appearance of toilets in Dickens or something like that. And so you get people who are good intention but don't know anything teaching middle school and high school. <clears throat> and then, of course, you get some people that know stuff, but then maybe they give up or they think they're too good for it, so they quit teaching high school or quit teaching middle school. Or they end up in a really unsupportive environment, so they leave for their own, yeah, their own care. And uh, Or they end up in a really nice, fancy school that all the kids, you know, their parents are super into classics and all this type of stuff. Which I think is what happens, and that's why you get like really bottom of the barrel schools that have horrible teachers. Those are schools that I went to because my parents were not wealthy. We didn't live in really the best neighborhoods. We kind of lived in average areas where, you know, you'd had AP classes, which were, you know, a couple smart kids, and everyone else was really hard workers, and, you know, and no one cared about anything, and no one had any like personal curiosity. But, uh, Yeah, it's really, uh, really a dismal spectacle, you could say, of um, teaching prospects. Because I'm sure I'll, I'm sure I'll be fine. You know, I actually care about <laughs> what I'm going to be teaching, so it'll be easy for me to come up with lessons and come up with varying lessons and stuff. But my classmates, like, I'll give you uh, an example. So one of my classmates. I uh, had to buy an anthology of 20th century poetry by Rita Dove for one of my classes, which is a terrible anthology, by the way. And Helen Vendler shits on it. <clears throat> but, you know, she's holding, my classmate is holding this anthology in their hand, and they're saying, 
you know what, I'm going to keep this anthology so I can put it on my shelf in my classroom so that my students will think I'm, uh, you know, you know, like erudite or something like that. It's like, what? What? Is this supposed to be funny? You know, and um, the other day I actually had the fortune of seeing Satan Tango by Bela Tarr in a, in, in a movie theater because, you know, they just restored it. And I was shocked how much people were laughing at the movie. Because uh, it's a very, very depressing movie. You know, it's very pessimistic. Very, very pessimistic. With, with a sense of strength to it. But it's very pessimistic. I kind of think of it in the sense of Cormac McCarthy where he says, you know, you know, I'm pretty pessimistic about a lot of things, but that's no reason to be... Uh, to be upset about it or to be in a bad mood about it, something like that. And that's kind of how I see it. You know, I'm, I'm pretty much strongly pessimistic on just about everything, but, you know, we're already here, so you might as well try to do stuff anyway. And, uh, yeah, I had a bizarre experience at the movie theater, too. Because <coughs> during one of the intermissions, I was reading... The book, Satan Tango, by Krasna Horkai, trying to see how they compared the movie and the book. And some middle-aged lady comes up to me and is shocked that I'm reading. And really, I just didn't want to talk to her at that point. Because she was making it like, oh, you're sitting here reading and we're all film buffs, you know, as far as like, it's a separation. Because, yeah, I was the only one reading Maybe it's not normal to read during an intermission of a film, but I've never been to an intermission of a film, so I'm not sure what you're supposed to be doing. But I had decided to bring Prey and Satan Tango because, yeah, they're Hungarian books. I'm seeing a Hungarian movie. Why not? <laughs> but, um... Yeah, I mean... Hmm. Yeah, it's really, I think it's really dismal what I, what I see. And another thing I thought is about like the lowering of standards or expectations, because if you're a teacher, you have to have very low standards for your students. Not, not to the extent of what you expect of them, where, you know, if I had exceptionally low standards, there's no way I would have brought in Finnegan's Wake. You know, I would have brought in a children's book or something like that, so they all understood it. But you have to kind of maintain high standards for yourself. You have to be optimistic about the kids. But you have to have exceedingly low expectations. You know, partially because you've already been through school. And I could see in my AP senior high school class, when we were reading Shakespeare, that Maybe three quarters of the kids didn't understand half the words, which is terrifying, really, because it's not that hard. I think I have a privileged position in some sense, but yeah, so you, ha you have to realize that, you know, you have to realize what's going on. You can't be delusional, but you can still have high standards. And, uh, yeah, I've been thinking a lot about Because really in English, there have not been good contemporary novels. You know, you have the really old guys still putting out good stuff, like McCarthy. Or, uh, you know, Pinchon is someone a lot of people like. And then you have a generation, or a little more, older than me, like Evandara. Or, again, a lot of people like uh, Infinite Jest. They seem to feel it describes the times or it did over 20 years ago but then there has not been one recently there has not you know this all lit stuff is dreadful just like a joke it's disgusting really oh shoot i'm sitting on a <laughs> box of books <clears throat> pardon that so if i look terrified 
But yeah, alt lit is hilarious. And there's really nothing else. Like you have like what? Duck's Newberry Port, which is like, come on. I mean, at least she's trying, but. And uh, <clears throat> that's partially why I was trying to read uh, or wanting to read Laszlo Krasnohorka recently because, you know, he's he's like 20 years younger than the McCarthy Pinchon generation. And he's about 10 to 20 years older than Evandara and uh, David Foster Wallace. So I was trying to get an idea of what he would write. And, you know, I, I was thinking to myself, you know, what would I write if I was really trying to do justice for, like, contemporary times? And I was thinking, you know, why wouldn't you write about science and mathematics? Why wouldn't you write about, you know, quantum physics or, you know, computer science or artificial intelligence, these sort of things? Why wouldn't you write about financial disasters and you know, cyber war and cyber crime and, you know, the failing healthcare system and, uh, you know, the diminishment of education and people afraid of the advancement of learning in, you know, the 21st century. Why wouldn't you write about all that stuff? And the only reason you wouldn't is if you can't. And I do think it's getting harder and harder, although it's never been easy. I think it's getting harder and harder to to account for everything because I really haven't met anyone in my English classes that like enjoys science or or like enjoys math apart from like you know they like uh, you know I don't know math tricks or whatever but you know they're not actually into math and unfortunately I'm not either although I'm trying to fix that recently but you know, I, I really wanted to, my first choice of a major was physics, but then I couldn't because of a move, and then I decided I didn't want to do that anymore, and then I chose English, but I still have that love of physics, although I never studied in university, so, and uh, I seem to have not met many people like myself in that way, but I'm trying to think of all the writers who really liked math or physics and then wrote good books like Arno Schmidt or James Joyce to an extent or Robert Musil, William Gaddis, Evan Dara. Or like even adding in music. Like it seems like such a trivial thing, but a lot of the people I meet who want to be writers really don't know anything. So I'm thinking, like, what are they going to write about? They would write about nothing if they don't know anything. And it is a very high standard that you have to hold to where, like, you pretty much have to be learning stuff all the time to be able to handle <clears throat> writing about all that stuff. But why not? Like, why wouldn't you do that? It's just out of laziness and, like, like fragility, which is fine because it's there. And to an extent, you can't do anything about it, but... I'm also thinking, like, what what would a work about the current require? And I think you'd have to talk about the internet. Like, you'd have to... And I worry about saying represent the internet. Because, you know, like, a representation of the stream of consciousness, which, you know, everyone likes to talk about is it's completely different than it actually is and so I wonder you know how would you represent it like I don't know I think about that and then like the advancement of technology to where artificial intelligence exists and like emails and if you wanted to how would you portray Wikipedia rabbit hole and like across the world communication you'd have to be pretty good at languages too to do justice to it you'd have to have read all the books in the recent trajectory of contemporary classics like you'd have to have read Finnegan's Wake you'd have to have read at least some of Bottom's Dream you'd have to have read 
Joao Guimarães Rosa, you'd have to have read Pessoa, um, Proust, Musil, Miklos Senkuthi, you'd have to have read McCarthy, maybe Pinchon, um, maybe some more contemporary stuff that maybe was decent but failed. You have to read contemporary poetry. You'd have to be very versed in modernism and Renaissance stuff and the old classics. And, you know, I never meet anyone that is. <laughs> so it's like, is no one trying to do this stuff or is it impossible? Or is like only one or two people, is it only one or two people in the world or in the United States or whatever, that are trying, and then even if they try, or even if they do, it doesn't get published, or it's self-published, and it falls in a bin of, you know, erotica or self-help books. I don't know, but, uh, yeah, well, I hope you've enjoyed this video that's mostly a vlog in a closet. But, um, yeah, uh, well, if you watch the whole thing, that is a gang boss.